Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, to learn a little bit more tonight about Tangible Hydropeg. My name is Kevin Bly. I'm a senior marketing consultant for Tangible Science. First of all, I'd like to thank Excel. Normally, this program would be hosted by them, but unfortunately, the people that usually host it are down with laryngitis, so I'm going to step in as both moderator tonight as well as doing the first part of the presentation on Tangible Hydropeg. I'm going, to buy, so I'm going to start by giving a brief background on myself and also introduce uh, the background of Dr. Jerry Robin, who's going to be presenting the case history on uh, dry eye and the use of tangible hydropeg with that patient. Again, my name is Kevin Bly. I am a 35-year veteran in the uh, contact lens and eye care industry. I'd like to say I was 35 years old, but that's not the case. I've been involved in the last 10 years doing consulting work in new technology initiatives and contact lenses advanced refraction, dry eye, blue light spectacle lens technology, and also artificial intelligence. Dr. Robin graduated from Nova, Nova Southwestern University College of Optometry in 2009. He is currently the Chief Optometrist and Director of Clinical Research at Bowden Eye and Associates in Jacksonville, Florida, which is an ODMD primary care practice specializing in cornea, anterior segment, and dry eye disease. Dr. Robert is also an adjunct cl clinical professor at Midwestern University, College of Optometry in Glendale, Arizona. He serves as a founding member and contributor to Dry Eye University, and they can be found at dryeyeuniversity.com, and is a founding member of the Medical Advisory Board and is current clinical director for Dry Eye Access, and that can be found at dryeyeaccess.com. Dr. Robin has served on multiple advisory industry panels lectures naturally and currently oversees multiple research studies being done in his practice ranging from dry eye, glaucoma, contact lenses, and surgical outcomes. So I'm going to go ahead and get started at this time. And we're going to start by letting me give you a brief introduction of tangible hydropeg and how it got started. In 2011, a group of three very unique individuals with very different backgrounds entered into the Stanford Biodesign Program. The names of Vic McRae, who was a trauma surgeon by training and was also out at USF at the time in their residency program. Brandon Falcons, who was a mechanical engineer by training and had worked with medical device companies in cardiology, orthopedics, and other areas and a young lady by the name of Karen Haverstreit, who was finishing up her chemical engineering PhD, as well as her MBA at Stanford. The Stanford Biodesign Program typically goes and picks an area of concentration in medical research and has the students that are coming in concentrate into that particular area. And in 2011, the area that they had picked out was in ophthalmology, and the specific area that was charged with the three of them was in contact lens comfort. When they originally started, the company was known as Opt Optical Dynamics, and improving the contact lens experience for patients and practitioners, and contact lens manufacturers alike with rigid lenses, was what they were charged with. However, as they have uh, developed over the last few years, and as things have uh, obviously evolved naturally, the current vision of tangible science is to create a family of groundbreaking products that make contact lens comfort and experience easier for everyone involved, practitioners, patients, and manufacturers alike. Now, as we know, contact lens materials um, by their nature can cause discomfort, tear film disruption. And that's particularly true with just the base material of RGP materials by their nature. They're hydrophobic. Even the best manufactured lenses are going to have microscopic pits and areas where indeed you can get protein and lipid deposition, et cetera, et cetera. Compound that, however, by what's going on in our lifestyles today and the vast majority of contact lens wearers, as well as the vast majority of people in just normal lifestyle and the working environment, are using digital devices for two to four hours. And in many cases, the average is four to six hours which decreases blink rates and only contributes to the contact lens that's covered that you're going to have at that stage of the game. Indeed, contact lens comfort continues to be a challenge. We probably have 42 to 44 million people wearing contact lenses in the industry today. 
which you know continues to grow a little bit each year. But interestingly enough, we still lose almost as many patients every year to contact lens wear as we take on a new patient wear. Mm. Mm. I'm getting some noise. Hi, I'm getting some noise in the background. Excuse me. So anyhow, let me go, let me go on and talk about tangible hydropeg and how it works. The way tangible hydropeg works is that we put an entirely new bulk layer of material on the lens. So it's no longer the contact lens material that touches the eye. It's all material. We did so by doing the chemistry part first, figuring out how to actually grow a thin layer of hydrogel on top of these lenses. Then we did the biology piece. We tested many different materials to figure out which ones interacted naturally with the eye and improved the comfort. So basically what you have in tangible hydropeg is a biocompatible polymer that completely encapsulates the lens. The polymer is covalently bonded, permanently attached to the surface of the lens. This thin layer of distinct material has its own properties that enhance, enhances the surface of the lens to improve wettability, increase resistance to lipid deposits, improve lubricity, and reduces friction between the lens and the eyelids during blinks, and it definitely decreases the occurrence of any kind of fogging. Tangible hydropeg, as I said, hides the surface of the lens physiology and preserves the natural tear layer and the tear physiology. The coating itself is based on polyethylene glycol, known in the industry as PEG, a substance that is used in ocular lubricants for decades. PEG is known to improve surface wettability, improves breakup time, increases the smooth, lubricous feeling of the lens, and reduces deposits. The propriety hydropeg material is 90% water, and the PEG formulation is different because it incorporates two very different polymers in addition to the PEG, which adds to the unique qualities that hydropeg gives on the surface of a lens. It's designed to fill the microscopic pits on contact lenses, and build, uh, builds a smooth, wet layer that is permanently bonded to the surface of the lens. It effectively shields the, tilt, uh, shields the tear film from the hydrophobic material so that the only thing that's exposed to the lens is the hydrophilic, very wettable, tangible hydropeg material that closely matches the natural environment of the eye. Now, picture is worth a thousand words. I'm gonna show you a couple of slides. These are all available on the tangible, uh, tangible hydropeg or tangiblescience.com on their website. They have both a patient and a practitioner resource area. And as you can see on the first lens, when the drop was put on it, the Cecil drop on the untreated contact lens, it beads up and it stays on the lens. When it was put on the tangible hydropeg lens, notice how it spreads evenly and coats the lens entirely almost immediately. Tangible hydropeg coating also resists deposits very well, and I'm gonna show you a series of three different lenses now. The first is an untreated lens that is dipped into the lipid uh, diassay, and when you see it dipped in, uh, obviously the lipids adhere to the lens, and even when it's rinsed, you see it adhering, uh, much of the material still adhering to it. The second lens is a plasma-treated lens, and again, a lot of the lipid dye adheres to it, and then in the second stage, when it's rinsed off, much still stays on the lens. This is the tangible hydropeg lens, and notice it doesn't adhere to the lens when it's rinsed. So again, what you're going to get is a lens that's going to not allow lipid deposits to stay particularly on the lens the full time. Not only that, it's going to increase tear stability, decrease fr uh, friction, and also take away a lot of the inflammation risk that you're going to have with that product. This is just a sample of a lens now. Uh, the first lens that you're seeing right now is a plasma-treated scleral lens. And as you can see, even with the blinks and everything, the lens has deposition, dry spots, and coating. And the same lens was remade using tangible hydropeg and contamac optimum material. And as you can see in the blink, you see very few areas where there are any dry spots or anything that would cause any discomfort with the contact lens. So when to consider tangible hydropeg, obviously with patients who have a history of poor wetting, that are heavy depositors, have scleral fogging, perhaps a new GP lens wearer, any patient that's looking for a more comfortable lens. 
Other considerations with tangible hydropeg is that it has no known contraindications and it does not change the lens fit in any way, shape, or form. It is available on, available on corneal, scleral, and hybrid lens designs. Can be, it is applied to lenses at the time of manufacture. The one caveat is that tangible hydropeg is slippery when wet. When it's first used by a patient that hasn't, have uh, hasn't had any experience with it, it can be more slippery, it can be harder to handle. So care has to be taken in the handling instructions and the care and handling instructions that is given to the patient. One area that we have seen is that people that can be particularly aggressive in terms of the care and handling of their lens occasionally feel that the coating thickness can decrease over time for some patients. And I'll talk about that in one more second uh, on a subsequent slide. In terms of compatible care systems, multi-purpose, you have the unique pH by Menicon. You have the Boston Simplus. Peroxide, clear care, and clear care with hydroglide. It's very important with lenses treated with tangible hydropeg not to use abrasives, alcohols, polishes, progen, or tap water. And indeed, if a patient needs to remove a tangible hydropeg treated lens during the day and rinse it, they should be using saline for that. Last but not least, tangible hydropeg is currently a uh, approved on all the optimum, uh, optimum products by Contamac. And the good news is to expand the usage of this product, the Boston materials by Bosch and Loam and the Paragon materials have already been approved by Tangible Hydropeg. And in most cases, those factories are now going ahead and uh, putting into Tangible Hydropeg. So we expect that during the first quarter of this year, all materials from those three companies will be available with Tangible Hydropeg. In addition, two other additions are coming. Uh, tangible is re releasing towards the end of the first quarter tangible clean which is which is its own cleaning and disinfecting uh, solution system and also tangible boost we talked about some patients uh, perhaps handling the lenses a little bit harshly and feeling like the tangible is is not as effective well this is a monthly conditioning solution that when you soak the tangible hydro uh, tangible lenses in there uh, with the tangible hydropeg on there you're going to end up having the same exact wow sensation that you have with your patients when they first put on that tangible hydropeg treated lenses. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Jerry Robin, who's going to talk to you about a patient with uh, uh, dry eye and using, uh, obviously, Atlanta scleral lens. So, Jerry, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome, Kevin. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot for uh, all the attendees coming. Uh, or uh, joining with us tonight, thanks to Excel, and of course, thanks to Tangible for putting these uh, webinars together. Um, let's see, how do you advance this? There we go. There, there you go. So, yeah, I got it. So, th for those of you who don't know, this is uh, this has been a series of webinars. This is the fourth in the series, and the previous three presenters have been, you know, very well renowned. Uh, uh, respected contact lens specialists, and, and then there's me. So I am I'm not one of those, you know, fellow contact lens fitters and, and authorities in in the contact lens world by any means. No, I'm more of a dry eye guy. Uh, but it, dry eye and and these scleral lenses really it has always been an, a, a hand in hand type of approach. It's just that not very many of us have been doing it, and so. I made it a point to really learn how to do this. And I found out that it's not that hard, and especially using the XL Atlantis lenses, you know, I, I've got pretty, uh, pretty confident with my scleral lens fitting pretty quickly uh, with ease. The HydroPeg coating to me is just a no brainer. And so this case is going to kind of illustrate just, just how much utilizing both of these tools together makes perfect sense. So, uh, in this case, we're talking about an upbeat but frustrated young lady who came to me uh, for a consultation about possible scleral lens fitting. She has a known history of keratoconus. Uh, she was recently successfully treated with a surgical procedure of intact and collagen cross-linking in her left eye. Uh, her left eye uh, suffered from the, the most severe of, of the two eyes with the corneal aptasia. Uh, the, the right eye uh, does have uh, a cone, does have some uh, ectasia, but at this point, we're not planning on doing anything 
uh, surgically on the right eye. Her main concern to me now is that she wishes to have improved vision and better ocular comfort. Prior to her intacts and cross-linking, she was relying really just on glasses and soft contacts, which is obviously not optimal for a comb. Uh, neither of them uh, were performing very well for her. Her distance VA was best corrected as 2040 in the right eye with her glasses and soft lenses and, and really poorly at 2100 in the left eye. After the intacts and the cross-linking, her left eye did improve uncorrected. She was at 2060, and we were able to get her close to 2040 with glasses, but she still wasn't satisfied with that. Uh, at the time that she saw me, she was pretty distraught. She's a, a young mother of two kids. Uh, she's, you know, of course, busy and trying to drive all over the place, and she'd been suffering with this for quite a while. Uh, she was better, but she confided in me that she was really having a hard time driving around. She didn't have much confidence in herself anymore. She even had caught herself driving the wrong way down uh, down the street a few times. And so, I mean, she was really uh, concerned. So she had already uh, also told me that she had a history of wearing a corneal GP lens prior to the, the surgery and she couldn't tolerate it due to her dry eye, probably due to not the best fit ever. She she just had no interest in going back in a corneal GP. Uh, she was noticing now that with her soft lenses, she was becoming intolerant. And so this is, you know, dovetails right with what Kevin was saying in that, you know, a, a certain percentage, about 27% of contact lens wearers are going to drop out at some point. And, and so controlling the dry eye and addressing the dry eye and being proactive in the dry eye care can certainly help to slow that down. And, and in this case, we're going to try to get her back under control so that we can, you know, make her comfortable and make her see better. Uh, because of her intolerance to now her soft lenses, she finds herself dependent on the glasses. And again, you know, either one of those don't give her a great visual outcome. So these are her uh, corneal topographies. You can see what we're dealing with here. And of course, the left eye has certainly had a little bit more going on over here. And her dry disease, you know, when, when she presented to our corneal surgeon, Dr. Bowden, uh, you know, she she had all the dry eye symptoms. Her dry eye disease is not new. It didn't just happen after the, the corneal procedures. And so we recognized it straight away and started to educate her about it. You know, dry eye disease, it's a chronic and it's a progressive disease. It's real. Um, you know, hopefully I like to think that it, uh, at least most of eye care providers are starting to wake up to this fact to the fact that dry disease, it is a chronic and progressive disease. It requires early diagnosis, aggressive treatment, and consistency in that treatment in order to best address it. Dry eye is, is kind of like the meddler in everything. It has this knack at making nearly every other ocular condi condition that a patient has, dry eye finds a way to make it worse, right? So if you're having cataract surgery, dry eye can confound that. And, create poor endpoints and poor results and discomfort afterwards. Same thing with contact lenses. If you're trying to refract somebody and you have somebody with dry eye, their vision is, you know, constantly fluctuating and, you know, the, it, it decreases their quality of life. And so we recognize that straight away using some of our standard metrics that we employed at her initial presentation with our cornea specialist. And so we rely on a speed questionnaire, which is the standard patient evaluation of eye dryness. We use this instead of something like the OSDI. We just feel like the speed is, is easier, it's quicker, it's easier to digest, it doesn't have as many questions, and you don't have to do as much math. The, uh, the max score on a speed is 28. On the case of ours, we have what's called a modified speed that we kind of took and made it our own. Uh, this patient's speed score on her initial visit was 20, and so that's, that's pretty severe, actually. Her meibomian gland count was at 22, grade two, and so for those of you not aware, you know, with the meibomian glands, we all have about 25 or 30 per lid, and so what we do is, is we try to assess how many of them are functional, and so in her case, 
uh, she had 22 of the glands functional, which is pretty good, but the quality of the mybum was subpar. So when we grade it, we grade it from a score of three to two to one, ultimately zero. And three is the olive oil type consistency that we're all looking for. Two, grade two is the most common presentation that we see. It's kind of the opaque, turbid gel type of appearance. So we take our finger or a Q-tip and, and just kind of press across the, the lid margin and just examine the glands. Uh, her cornea, of course, shows some ectasia, some apical scarring in the left eye, uh, confluent staining, uh, early tear breakup time, uh, lysamine green staining, tear osmolarity was uh, pretty elevated, to uh, 323 in the right eye and, and uh, 332 in the left eye. And she had positive MMP9, which means, you know, her her inflammation is, is out of control. And there's really no surprise with how symptomatic she was. And then we were able to get our lipid layer thickness and mybography, which is routine for us. Uh, the lipid layer thickness is the measurement of the lipid on the ocular surface in real time. Uh, and her number was great. It was 100 plus. That's actually the max number. That doesn't mean then that she doesn't have dry eye. Uh, it's just one metric, uh, but it does mean that, you know, we have a, 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 a lot to work with here. Uh, likewise, her mybography was pretty good. Uh, she did not have any atrophy as we look across the, the glands here, but she did have some, certainly some dilation, some segmentation, some uh, misdirection of the glands and the like. And so she does have some obstruction to the gland, which was noted. Uh, on the, the grade of the mybum, this just kind of gives us a, a snapshot look at the anatomy. And in, in the end, again, it, it's, it's a good prognosis that the glands are all there. If we unclog them, uh, then it's likely they can come back online and we can continue to rehabilitate and, and uh, improve her uh, ocular surface disease and specifically with that, the MGD. So prior to her intacts and cross-linking, we placed her on an, an aggressive but appropriate dry eye regimen. And the, this is pretty pretty standard in our practice for dang near anybody who's gonna get any kind of surgery, we're going to uh, uh, assess and treat and allow time for things to, to kind of kick in and start working and not only the symptoms, but the, the diagnostics to show improvement. And so we put her on a, a preservative-free lubricant. We really like the Oasis Tears. In, in this situation, uh, because she did have a decent amount of lipid, so we didn't need to use a lipid-based tear like Retain MGD. Uh, of course, put her on a lid scrub. Uh, Ocusoft Platinum is a good one that we use uh, for general use. Uh, Hydro Eye Vitamins using the GLA uh, Omega-6 Vitamin. That's been our choice for years. We feel like it's about the best nutraceutical you can go with. Warm compresses, of course, we like the derm mask in her case, and of course, her stasis. Her stasis is a tried, true, and tested uh, medication. Uh, we use Zydra uh, uh, in plenty of opportunities as well, um, but in this case, uh, we went with her stasis because we feel like it has a nice broad spectrum approach. We feel like long-term, it's gonna help her. I like it a lot with my contact lens wares. And uh, because of her uh, active inflammation seen on her MMP9, uh, went ahead and, and uh, went with the cycle pulse dose of Lodomax. And we let this all kind of work for about three months until we were satisfied that she was ready to proceed then with surgery. We also advised her that uh, getting a Blefex treatment of the eyelids to exfoliate and debride them uh, is always recommended prior to surgery. and. Also, due to the obstruction of her glands, a lipoflow treatment was ordered, uh, but she was faced with some pretty significant out-of-pocket expense as it is with the intacts and the cross-linking, and she just was not ready to pr proceed with those. Uh, and, and that's her choice, of course. We always recommend to patients that look, in the real world, this is the best thing we can do. We're, we're here to advise. We're here to, to uh, set you up for the best success. And so we always uh, will recommend these procedures appropriately. But we also let them know that, you know, look, if, if, if you're not ready to do it now, if we get to a point with the other treatment that we can do the surgery, we do it. 
and we can always go back to these treatments as we go. So she had her treatment. She had the, uh, the intact ring segments placed in the left eye. Uh, the intact ring segments are these, these little PMMA ring segments here that are uh, placed into the stroma. There's, there's uh, these channels that are, are carved in with a laser, like an interlaced laser. We're using the femtosecond laser now to create these channels. And then the surgeon slides these uh, rings in, in place and sutures them in place. These rings are not just arbitrarily placed in there. There's a lot of calculations and there's a lot of a, almost an artistic uh, uh, nuance to it that, uh, that certainly I don't understand. But the cornea surgeons uh, know uh, how to place these and what ori orientation in order to act as a scaffolding to slow the, the, the progression of the ectasia. Uh, in some cases, they can be used to flatten the curvature a little bit and improve vision, but, but it's not necessarily a refractive treatment primarily. It's more of that stabilization, scaffolding type treatment. She also, again, had the, the collagen cross-linking, which in this country is relatively new, but it's been used in Europe and Asia and other places uh, for years. Uh, so we do the epi-off protocol. Uh, to get more riboflavin there available. And uh, that's what it is. It's just riboflavin drops placed onto the, the cornea, uh, allowed to, to basically uh, penetrate into the tissue and the UVA light activates it and causes these bonds to be formed. So just like back in organic chemistry where disulfide bonds would uh, increase molecular structure and instability, well, these uh, bonds within the uh, corneal fibers do the same thing. And so it, 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 again, is designed to hopefully halt or at least slow the progression of the keratoconus. And so it's not a cure uh, like it's often discussed among patients, but what we like to do in our clinic is combine the two. And the idea behind that is, is we're, we're thinking long-term. We're thinking, what can we do to hopefully prevent this patient from ever having to have a, a corneal graft. And so these are the strategies that we employ. And so after her treatment, uh, her corneal topography of the left eye, you know, virtually looks the same, but if you zoom in on it and look at it, uh, she did have some uh, flattening of the, uh, the, the, the central zone. So she went through all of that and healed and got through her global period. And about three to four months later, she found her way to me via Dr. Bowden, the cornea surgeon. He was ready for her to come to see me to get a, uh, a scleral lens uh, possibly fit. Remember, her main concern is to improve her vision and her ocular comfort. We we're hoping to solve both problems. So we sat down and we had the contact lens consultation. I approached this case with the desire to give her uh, obviously the best options from the start. You know, as I mentioned, she was pretty frustrated. She was pretty distraught and she just needed an answer, you know, yesterday. Uh, I needed to give her the best option to improve her vision and also uh, do that while improving her comfort. So. I knew that the comfort of the lens was going to be paramount to the success of her fit. I, I knew that she would probably lose confidence quickly. Remember, she had tried corneal GPs before, not successful, not interested. She was uh, uh, losing her confidence in her ability to wear the soft lenses. So I needed to basically hit this out of the park straight away. So I knew that a scleral lens was clearly the best answer for both of her needs. So uh, I decided to use the XL Atlantis scleral lens. It's the only scleral lens that I fit uh, due to its easy one, two, three fitting approach. Remember, I'm not, you know, some cornea specialist. I'm just a regular OD in the trenches. So I have found that this lens just makes perfect sense for me. Uh, and I also knew that I would be able to coat the lens with tangible hydropeg. So again, I wanted to give her the best option to uh, best options to have her success straight away. So briefly on you know, scleral lenses, they are a, a, an underutilized asset, as I said before, uh, not only for you know, irregular corneas, but especially in the world of dry eye. 
uh, as I mentioned, you do not have to reserve these for the cornea specialist. Any of us can fit these if you want to. Um, they do provide excellent vision, excellent comfort with, when fit correctly. And you do not have to just reserve them for a regular corneas. They have, they work great for people who uh, just need to see really good and, and have their, you know, in this case, dry eye improved. Uh, and of course, can be very lucrative and a rewarding service to provide. The uh, the uh, Atlantis Scleral Lens again has the easy one two three fit strategy. Uh, their 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 uh, trial set's very small. Uh, uh, you can take it anywhere, uh, and very easy to use. Uh, they do have great single vision and multifocal design. So again, you know, if you have a a presbyopic patient who's frustrated with their soft lenses and has dry eye or doesn't have dry eye, uh, you know, try this uh, scleral lens multifocal. I think you'll be really impressed with it. And then again, you know, it's a no-brainer for me uh, putting the tangible hydropeg on these lenses to give every patient, you know, the, the best comfort uh, and all of the attributes that Kevin was talking about to me is just a no-brainer. So after the consultation and discussing the strategy, we uh, proceeded with the fitting. And, and, and so the fitting of her right eye was very straightforward. I think it took me two lenses uh, and uh, we did the over refraction and got her to a, an acceptable fit and an acceptable endpoint. And, uh, and we were ready to order. The left eye, uh, you know, again, uh, has a little bit more going on, some apical scarring and, and the like. Uh, it took me about four lenses, uh, and then again, we were able to get her down to a fairly acceptable endpoint on the over-refraction. So we ordered the lenses, and again, we ordered them with tangible hydropeg. So as a side note, uh, I, I have heard other practitioners, you know, kind of almost reserve the hydropeg for their difficult patients, or, you know, I don't need to put hydropeg on everyone. And, and in our practice, you know, again, I, I don't, you know, hold back what I think is the best or pick and choose who I'm going to give it to. In our practice, no matter who orders a lens, any of the optometrists, if it's a GP lens, it comes with a hydro peg on it. So we got the lenses in. She came in about 10 days later and uh, we put them on. Uh, we had to teach her how to put on scleral lenses and, and, and she was motivated. And so, you know, it was relatively smooth. She Got the right eye in easily. The left eye is a little bit more sensitive, took a little bit more time, but uh, she picked it up very quickly. And uh, her vision, once it settled, was 20-20 in the right eye and 20-30 in the left eye. And I was feeling pretty good about that. Uh, the ovary fraction was plano. And she noted that, you know, just straight away, she was surprised at how comfortable the lenses seemed. And again, in her mind, she's thinking about those corneal GPs. And, and so she was pleasantly surprised at how comfortable these were uh, straight out of the box. So we let her go home with them. We let her test drive them, uh, get used to putting them in, taking them out, wearing them and the like. And we wanted to see how her eyes held up. So she came back after wearing them for a couple weeks and, uh, and she was a different person. So in the, in the previous, uh, exams with me anyways, you know, she came in, like I said, kind of disheveled and distraught and wearing sweatpants and no makeup and her hair was barely done. And, and she came in on this visit, you know, almost completely different. She was dressed up. She had her makeup on. She had a cute little hat on. And you could tell that, that she kind of had some confidence back. She was feeling good. And to me, that made me feel good. I mean, I knew we were getting somewhere with her more than just fitting contacts, but improving her quality of life. Uh, she was tolerating them great. She was very happy. She said she felt good. Uh, uh, her eyes felt good. They looked more healthy, more white. And she was able to drive around without any uh, uh, mistakes anymore. Uh, looked at the fits. Everything looked uh, well aligned after wearing them for a while. Uh, we removed the lenses to see what her cornea looked like. Much improved ocular surface, not perfect. Still had some uh, punctate staining and, and that's okay. We were just heading in the right direction. You know, dry eye doesn't happen overnight. It's not gonna get better overnight, but we were, we were certainly moving the ball in the right direction. 
So we finalized it. Boom, we finalized it. Uh, it was a it was a pretty simple fit when you think about how how you know complex she her whole story was. But in the end, it was just a pretty straightforward uh, scleral contact lens fit. Um, I advised her that the dry disease was not cured, even though we were so much better. We we had only stabilized and controlled uh, her condition. She needed to continue the supportive treatments. And, and that the use of the, the Atlanta sclera on the tangible hydropaque coating was allowing us to better treat her dry eye now. Uh, I reminded her that she would still likely benefit from the core therapy, the Blefex, the Lipoflow, and that's something that we continue to talk about. Uh, I have also prescribed her the True Tier neuro, Neurostimulator device. Uh, I use that myself. It's, it's awesome for contact lens patients to help uh, and increase the natural tear uh, stimulation. Uh, and at this time, you know, she's still kind of recovering from her financial uh, uh, investment, but she feels good about in that investment of the Intex and the cross-linking now. So in conclusion, to kind of wrap this up, you know, dry disease is by definition a multifactorial chronic and progressive inflammatory disease. Each patient with dry disease needs to have a customized approach to their treatment in order to, you know, best control it. Uh, contact lens wares are known to have upregulated inflammatory mediators, just like in this patient's case, reduce meibomian gland function, same thing, and all the other dry findings. And we also know that patients who have had previous corneal surgery are more, more prone to dry eyes. So, you know, it, in just those two categories alone, she was a double whammy. So the, this patient was having very symptomatic dry eye and exacerbation with her contact lens wear, and of course, following the surgery likely made it worse, even with our efforts beforehand to try to control it as best we could. Without the proper control, it's likely she was just going to spiral out of control. Uh, she was already well on her way there. So she was also unsatisfied uh, uh, vision-wise following her procedures. She needed an, an option to improve her vision in both eyes. So the scleral contact lenses with a hydropaque coating offered a solution uh, to aid her in the majority of her problems. Again, didn't cure her. She still needs other supportive treatment and other dry eye treatments, and she always will. But this is, is, is helping to, to fill that void that, that she wasn't reaching with, uh, with all the treatments. Uh, we know that a, a properly fit scleral lens can help in the treating of corneal irregularities and improve her vision while aiding in her dry eye with the scleral lens tear reservoir. So adding a new and effective tool like tangible hydropeg to a very well-established treatment option like a scleral lens is a merger of an old and a new technology to maximize the patient experience in all aspects by improving her vision. We improved her ocular comfort and improved her contact lens wear time. And that's what it's all about right there. I mean, really every contact lens wear wants improved vision, improved comfort, uh, and improved wear time. And so using tangible hydropeg can really push that to the maximum. With the easy one-two fit approach of the Atlanta Square lens, it allows someone like me to look like a cornea lens specialist or a contact lens specialist. Um, and, and it can certainly work for you too. Uh, the tangible hydropeg is a wonderful addition to enhance patient and doctor experience in scleral lens fitting uh, beyond what was previously possible without this coating. And so that's really the take home message is that you know, this, again, isn't something just to reserve for your train wreck patients. That's often the mistake that's made. Uh, offer it to everybody because it will help everybody. Who doesn't want to have better comfort with their lenses? And so with that, I will hand it back over uh, and, and have some final thoughts on the XL lenses. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh Jerry, I, the case was absolutely fascinating, and I appreciate you sharing it with all of us. Um, 
what I'd like to do now is to uh, just talk a little bit about Excel um, on behalf of Kim and, and Tony, who would normally be doing this. What's impressive about Excel is, is, and the difference it can make in your practice, is the fact that they have over 100,000 scleral lenses on eyes, both U.S. and abroad, and over 3,000 scleral lens fitting sets out there distributed U.S. and abroad. And they are literally only one of two companies that offer specialty GP, soft, and disposable lens options in-house in one place. Uh, certainly, this is one of the educational seminars that they do, but they do a myriad of educational seminars, live and national and international seminars, wet labs, et cetera, and have a tremendous team of experienced fitters and proven expert clinical people that can help you with their very simple lens uh, fitting philosophy. Uh, in terms of their consultation team, they have 13 NCLE certified consultants uh, with a combined over 200 years of experience. And their consultation uh, is available from 8 to 8.30 every day, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, in terms of the value in the industry, they have very simple pricing. Same day turnaround on all GP and soft lens designs and a 90 to 120 day full warranty and full cancellation on all of their designs. And they also follow hassle-free returns, which is great because there's no need to return lenses for credit. It helps save time and money both for the practice and actually for them. And in terms of innovative manufacturing, I'm sorry, that was me. Uh, I have been to their facility. They have uh, robotic modules, RFID communication technology through the whole system, CNC lathes with just spectacular reproducibility, guaranteed reproducibility because of their technology. And as far as getting started with them, one of the, I think the great benefits they have is they have tremendous in-office assistance from their consultants. If you have three or more patients that you can schedule for a fitting, they will come in and do staff insertion and removal training. They will provide a fitting set if you haven't purchased one. They'll do on-hand fitting guidance and they're available for follow-up when you're getting started, perhaps fitting things like the Atlanta Squirrel or other lenses. Now, in closing, uh, we did not have any questions that have come up at this stage of the game, so I just want to do maybe one or two items of housekeeping. Audio tapes of this will be available on request, and if for any information or anything that you would like from that, please just reach out to Kim Bowles at xlspecialtycontacts.com.